say to you that the incidence of pediatric TB is a measure of the failure of your society to treat TB. Because you think about it as adults, we mix a lot. Children don't mix too much. Children get it from home, generally speaking. And so, if you've got a lot of children getting TB, it means actually your TB is out of control. And that's what's happening in my country. There's a lot more TB. When I got four referrals of spinal TB last week, and another one on Monday. So, I mean, they just come, they, there's, there's so many of them. Um, so, I mean, this is quite obvious, but I mean, I always like to think, you know, well, what's different? Now, obviously, they're smaller, okay? And they're much smaller in my country because they're malnourished. And it catches me out every time. Because the thing with x-rays, we have uh, digital x-rays. Everybody's x-ray is the same size. So in your mind, when you look at x-ray, you're always used to knowing how big the patient is looking at x-ray. It's difficult to say this x-ray, so usually the x-ray is smaller than the person. And it's, it's funny how in your mind, you never say, oh, this is an enlarged x-ray of a child. And it, it's made, over and over, I look at the x-ray, I go to the patient who's lying on the table, I'm like, I can't believe how small this person is, you know. And, I mean, we've all got children where, you know, I mean, my 13-year-old is this tall, whereas my patients that are 13 often sort of say, they this malnourished and hard lines, you know. So, and it comes into account in terms of blood loss, I mean, you've only got 70 moles per kilogram. And your instrumentation, can be an issue. So I often use cervical instrumentation in the thoracic area for these children. The other thing is they're still growing. And that means that they've got to worry about pulmonary, the, the, the respiratory function. We all know that if you do long thoracic fusions in an immature child, you're going to limit their full vital capacity and you can turn them into a respiratory cripple. So we've got to be cognizant of that. We should avoid anterior column resection, aggressive anterior column resection, because often TB just destroys part of the body. And the growth plates are still present. And if you don't operate them, you just wash out the pus, they may regrow. We've seen that. But if you go and do aggressive corpectomies, you remove all the growth plates, you've committed them to that size. Um, the, you can think about harnessing the power of growth by creating a posterior fusion tether and allowing it to correct. I'll come back to that. And the other thing is if you do an anterior column fusion, you need to complement it with a posterior fusion. So in adults, I do a lot of anterior only. But in the growing spine, you can't do that because if you just do an anterior column and osteodesis, you're going to, it's going to grow continuously at the back and you're going to get progressive kyphosis. And so one has to bear those things in mind. So it's a slightly different ball game when you think about your strategies here. And somebody mentioned, I think you mentioned this morning about uh, the toppling and all those sides I'll get to, but you may have facet instability in children because it's 360 degree disease, which I haven't seen in adults. I think maybe I've had one patient that's had 360 disease in adults, significant disease, but in children it's not that common. And this is a paper I think you, it was you were referring to. So this is uh, Red Sakran. Uh, it's not an X-ray based, based thing, but he basically looked at two types of natural histories with uh, children's TB, and one is an aggressive. Um, rapid deterioration, and that can be predicted with, if you see any of these signs. Now, this separation of the facets, toppling sign, coronal, and so on. For me, I think the common denominator here is that there's facet involvement. So if you just see that the facets are involved, that you've lost integrity of the facets, you're going to have trouble. So I think that's simply what that shows. So I've just added one extra indication, which is instability. So it's largely the same as adults. And I think diagnostically, your differential is much wider. So let's be careful. So they often come in with a hip pathology. I mean, this patient had hip pathology and spinal pathology. Um, but don't get caught out. I mean, I, this is a patient, one of my general orthopedic staff members got caught out. They booked a patient for a hip and cisnium drainage based on a fixed flexion deformity and pain on moving. And when we got to theatre, they took x-rays but didn't check them out. They got to the theatre, looked at the x-rays, hips are fine. They got L5 vision. Okay, so the reason this child wasn't walking in a fixed flexion deformity was because of a psoas abscess. Okay, so I just teach my trainees to be very careful. You can easily mix the two up. And it's not uncommon for us to see these psoas abscesses, uh, which may need draining. Here's a four-year-old child who comes with a little vertebral planar, MRI scan, and this turned out to be a cinephilic granuloma. So I think your differential a lot wider, actually. Very interesting child, this. Also a C4 lesion, increasing neck pain, uh, modestly increased infective parameters, could be TB, not typical, came back as a long thorn disease. So it's also it's a type of granuloma, non caseating So if you rely on histology, like people were talking earlier, we say from Nigeria, we're saying, oh, we just deal with, can you, we deal with granulomatous disease? It doesn't mean TB. 
take this chunk, though that was long for pentaglomerate disease penicillin. Here's a colleague of mine who saw his child, HL child. This is an orthopedic mother, anesthetic father. They were in tears and they found me about a month ago. The child had scoliosis, um, painful scoliosis. What I think, said, listen, anybody, if you came to me, if, if a child came to me with that history, I'd do full blood count, ESR, bone scan. Just because you doctors don't think you don't, shouldn't do that. So they did that massive hot spot on the right hand side first group. MRI scan looks miserable. CT scan, they were told this is a Ewing sarcoma. So you can imagine that the emails and the DICOM files were, files were going around the world. Um, everybody's planning courts and chemotherapy, all jump in the gun. I go and do a posture base. They were saying, let's go get a fine needle. I said, you can't do this with a fine needle. We need clarity. We need lots of tissue. Here. And um, that came back. And uh, after everything, I mean, this took about three weeks to sort out. Came back as cat scratch disease, Bardinella. Okay, so we're going to think a lot wider than TB, and that's why I think it's important that we do biopsies. Um, Torticollis can be a presentation. You can see this, we saw one of your examples earlier, where the patient had increased Atlanta dense interval, and um, you can see this destruction of the lateral mass here. And one, I just did a biopsy through the mouth, and um, and just treated non operatively. So, this is my indication. These are the patients in one of the papers we published on children, where predominantly we operate for deformity and neurology. So, that would be the pattern. Anterior only, I don't think that's useful in children for the reasons I explained earlier. In the older, the teenager, possibly, they're more adult like. But in the, in the younger child, I want to control progressive kyphosis with a posterior fusion. So, I normally add a posterior. And I, this is how I do it. So, if it's thoracic, I'll lie them prone. I'll pop the screws in. If I'm very feeling very cocky that day, I might do it from the side. But I, I get the screws in, I then close the wound. You can see I've just clipped it with some clips all, and then I put a tegaderm, a transparent dressing on. I then position the patient lateral decubitus, but right on the edge of the table. Okay, you'll see why in a minute. And then I will drape for thoracotomy and posterior. I'll do the thoracotomy, and then I open up the wound again, just removing those clips. I just cut through the tegaderm. I, put, I use a system that's got these extending poles on there, so I've got control. In a child, the bone's soft, so you don't want to just cramp down on those poles. You're going to just rip the screws out. So I first do the anterior release. I cut it out. I'll then simultaneously correct the deformity and pop the bone graft in the front. And then I will sit down on the chair and put two rods in at the back. So I leave the position for patients. So I only turn once. It's not front, back, front, or back, front, back. I mean, it becomes very tedious. Keep turning a patient, redraping. So I do the back. Then on its side, I do both simultaneously. And then, so that's how I do anterior and posterior and end up with this sort of result. And similarly, in the lumbar area, you know, you've got a severe uh, instability and compression, some neurology, and I would, yeah, I've had to span quite widely, but just put a rod in, I put a fibula in here with some support from posterior. You can see good clinical correction. TB is an interesting pathology because it eats away bone and leaves the discs behind. You can see this child, 10 year old child, these are discs. And when I got into the abdomen, I did the anterior, I took out five discs. These are discs floating in the abdomen. Just, uh, and then I put a fibula. In this case, I chose to put a rod there to hold it in place while I turned it in the back. You can do this all from the back, but if you want to get very, get very high, you can't do the thoracic, sorry, not off the back, proximal thoracic access. You want to get to the top. Normally, a thoracotomy, I can get to about T5. I can't get any higher. And even to be at T5 is uncomfortable. So, if I've got, after I want to get to T3, I do a periscapular, posterior lateral periscapular. So, I, I come through here, I lift the whole scapula up, and I get underneath and I go through the third rib. I can cut the second rib so I can push it out the way, and you can see what you get a beautiful access into the top of the chest. The ribs up there are quite substantial, so you can often use them if you want to. Um, but sometimes you get something that's even higher, cervical thoracic. I can't get there from uh, periscapulus. In this case, I've gone, I just said there's no way I can get you, so I've gone anteriorly through the neck, because I can get down to about T1, even T2 sometimes, for my plate onto T2, but at T1 I can still do a corpectomy on. Through the neck, I just, uh, I'll show another one where I've strapped them. You can see there's some pus coming out, corpectomy, fibula. Now there's no plate that I can use either. The sets I use, these are the narrow plates. 
but there's no long narrow plates in the other set. So what I've done is I've just used two anti-kickout plates and then did a post to your onlay fusion. You can see two anti-kickout plates and then I just put in a halo. Gave us slight warners, um, but that resolved. Okay, so that's how I would treat this patient. This is a picture similar to what we saw this morning. Severe abscess in the neck, cervical thoracic compression and collapse and myelopathy. I find traction in children not that useful. I do use it occasionally, but every time we go to the ward and have a look, the traction's not doing anything. The patient's pulling up on the bed, the weight's on the floor, so unless you're watching it yourself all the time, it doesn't really happen. So I would intraoperatively, I find you can often do it with a strap. You see, I've strapped to the shoulders, trying to create some space, do a Smith Robinson approach. I put my graft in, I just use an anti kick out plate at the bottom. I've turned it over and I've used a cervical set and I've put some pedicle screws into the proximal thoracic area, some lateral mass screws. I thought I was, I thought I was great. Unfortunately, at six weeks, you saw some lux above and I had to extend up to C2. You feel terrible about the doing this to such a young patient, but sometimes you just don't have an option. So, post year only. We just need to be remember that you know we know the demiglio data about the chest, but we also know that by the age of five, uh, European patients anyway have achieved seventy percent of their torsal growth. I think some of my patients are a bit behind this, but so from five on, uh, one can probably fuse longer. But the point is, there's no point doing a post on onlay fusion if they're older than five. In fact, I think there's some papers that show it's only really useful even at less than two. And I'll come back to that. I just forgot I put this case in. You can see here this patient increased ADI and uh, the structure we saw a case like this this morning. This is a simple posture on lay fusion for me in a halo. Um, I very seldom fix them, although I have it around four or five years of age. We spoke about the VCR. Um, in the acute phase, you can do it all from behind. Just put screws above and below, come around the side circumferentially, graft in. We're trying to prevent this, because this is a patient now that's got heel disease, rigid. This is where you have to use a VCR. But you see problems with this in children because it's such a powerful correction. And you can see I've gone and corrected it quite nicely. And uh, unfortunately, again, six weeks, she has fallen off the top. Proximal junctional failure. You've got such power when you correct these children. But of course, it's the anti sternum that's pulling it forward. And I have to go back and revise even higher. So we have to be careful how much correction we do with these children. But again, they do very well. You can see uh, the blue is pre-op and the uh, brown and yellow color, mustard color, is how they drift towards being normal after surgery. So in summary, in children, corrective instrument infusion is possible. I think it's important to limit your arthrodesis lens and to consider the effects of future growth. Thanks very much. Yeah, I think we just have to chat a little bit, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, I mean, that's fantastic uh, work. What you're doing. A couple of questions. One is, you know, you changed from anterior, you said you started doing more of posterior VCR. I mean, what, what was the reason? Uh, is there any reason why you, you're doing more? Are you doing, did you say you're doing more? So, yeah, look, especially in the children, because in the children, I tend to do a front and back, anterior and posterior. So, the reason to do it from behind is now only one, you know, one operation in the sense. I don't have to grape, and so it's quicker. So that's why, and if it's, especially if it's proximal thoracic, so if it's like a T3-4, it's difficult to get there anteriorly, so I'll do it all from behind. Um, in the adults, if it's mid-thoracic, my preference is still trans-thoracic. It's quick, cheap. You know, as soon as you go posterior, implant costs are much higher, because anteriorly it's two screws and a rod, but posteriorly it's probably eight screws and two rods, so it's, it's a multiple. Do you have settling of those grafts uh, when you choose anterior? Anterior only they do. They do, you do lose correction. So when you just put the graft in and then a single screw above and below, you lose about 5 to 10 degrees. But that, it's not a clinical problem, but radiographically you definitely lose it. And some of the things you need to avoid is damaging the end plates. So I think that's part of the problem. You put your cob in and you twist and you, you dent, you, you fracture the end plates. If you do that, then your graft's going to subside more. But if you, um, so I spend a lot, be very cautious with the cob to cleave things off without denting the end plate. But you're tempted to, you know, when you slide it into that disc, you tend to do that and then it just cuts, it breaks the disc, it breaks the end plate. In children, do you take off the metal work after you I intend to. 
But the reality is it doesn't happen. They, they, don't, they, come, they don't come back. They come back. You see, we treat like you for nine months. My, my standard treatment is four drugs, full dose for nine months. I mean, there's no discussion around that, but that's what I do. Um, and then I stop at nine months, and I bring them back three months later at one year to, and I serially, serially do ESR. So that's I monitor. And the reason I know CRP is better, but an ESR I can do myself in the clinic. So they come in. As they arrive in the clinic, the sister draws the blood and puts it up in the clinic. So it doesn't go to the laboratory. I can do that in the clinic. With the CRP, the tube of blood must be taken to the laboratory. Maybe takes four hours. With the ESR, it takes one hour. I've got the result. So I then monitor that ESR. And so nine months, so every three months, we've got an ESR and an X-ray. Nine months, I stop, stop the tablets if everything's going well. Then at one year, I see them again. So that one year, I say fine, then often they disappear. I mean, my patients come from 1,500 kilometers, 2,000 kilometers away. So, you know, once they're gone, they're not going to come back. Mother and child to catch a transport to see me is so expensive. Sorry, Mr. No. Look, I, I, I plan to take things out. If a patient comes back, I would take it out in two years uh, if I'm convinced there's a fusion. But also, the, a theatre time is a massive resource. I mean, you, when you visit us, you know. So. If I've got a sick patient needs surgery and a patient needs removal of metal, I'm always going to do the sick patient. And generally, that's always the case. It's very, very seldom. So the only time removal of metal can happen is if I'm sitting lecturing here and I've got registrars at home that can't do anything. I'll say, take some metal out, you know. But uh, I'm not going to take metal out when I've got other work to do. And, but you see, I, but I don't use crosslinks. And so I haven't had a problem. I think it's dangerous if you put screws in crosslinks because if they grow, possibly your screws are going, you know, get a cheese wire into your canal. So I haven't seen a problem from the instrumentation. And is there any evidence for the nine-month uh, regime, or is that something that's your hospital policy? It's, yeah, it's, look, I'm one of the more aggressive in terms of that. In South Africa, there's still people that are using 18 months. Mm -hmm. And when HIV first came, also we used to say, if you had HIV as well, we treat you 18 months, but there's no evidence for that. And so I use high dose, because then other people would give uh, four drugs for two months and then go into a continuation phase of rifampicin and isoniazid. That's what we do most of the time. Most of the time. And then the other thing that's changed is in the old days, in our country, we've got the DOC system, daily observed therapy, so they get seen to give the drug. It used to be five days a week. So in other words, you had two days you didn't get anything, because on the weekend, it was that you didn't get it. Now there's a seven-day DOCS, so they're getting more drug. So that's why I think nine months is fine. But I'm reluctant to go down to the two drug, I must say. But, you know, it's just like if something works. But, of course, you are worried about the uh, visual loss from ethambutol. I mean, it is a concern. So in children, I use three drugs. So I don't, in young children, I don't use ethambutol because you can't test for the visual acuity and the peripheral yeah. field loss. Yeah. Um, so Yes, so four drugs we use for three to four months, depending on the response. And then you change over to two drugs, usually for 12 months, nine to 12 months. Um, and again, as you said, uh, three months you do an MRI scan with CRP and ESR. Mm -hmm. And then again, another MRI scan in three months. No, we don't have, I don't MRI scan it. No, no further scan. The MRI is very expensive. It's, difficult. it's not difficult to get, but it's a resource limited difference. So we just use x rays, ESR. So only if the ESR is staying high. Or the patient's not improving neurologically with our re scan, but it's not a routine. We have the DOS regime is there, and we have some constraints on account of uh, giving four drugs and a complete AP to the patient because sometimes if something goes wrong, then uh, we, we are pushed to the corner. And that was the best way to help us with my services of this area. That is not the biggest problem because uh, officially you are not supposed to give the AP to the patient because they centers and they are giving more week uh, four days four days a week and it, it, it actually doesn't work. Yeah. So I, you know, I've just been nervous about reducing duration of therapy and reducing drugs. You know, so a lot of people are using 18 months of four drugs, so I've cut down to nine months. So I don't want to really drop the drug. I think it's daily dose. Daily dose. And we've also, I didn't mention it, but we've got a, in my series up to 11% drug resistance. So not multi-drug, but just one or two drug resistance. So that's you know, also something. So that's why I biopsy everybody to confirm that you're on the right drugs. I, mean, I, I recently operated on HIV and my experience was very limited with HIV. Um, and um, he had a lot of problems with toxicity with his um, antivirals as well as this. And he was on a two drug regime for two years. Sure. And he actually, luckily, he did well. 
Yeah. Um, so look, I mean, there's a lot of inter there's a lot of interaction of the HIV drugs and the TB drugs, and one has to be careful of that. And also, your TB drugs increase your induce your C5, uh, full, um, cytokine 450. So then you have to be careful what drugs you're using in HIV. It's quite a complex thing treating both. Yeah. I mean, you also mentioned the iris earlier. So you know that does make things very complicated. We would normally involve uh, infectious diseases group if we've got patients with HIV as well. But I would say at the moment about 50% of the patients that with TB that come to me are HIV positive. Is there anything different you do in your surgical approach for HIV patients? Uh, not really. I'm just a little bit, little bit more conservative. So I do their CD4 count. Um, I mean, sometimes they come to you and they're just full of pus. Uh, and that's, I mean, we have published on this. There seems to be a trend that there's less bony destruction and more pus. And so my, I'd be just to cost a transesectomy, suck out the pus. Even if, it's, even if they're uh, paraplegic with pus in the canal, because the paraspinal pus is connected to the pus in the canal. It's almost like a tensile system. And when you puncture the capsule and suck it, it decompresses a whole lot. So that's what I often do, is just a cost of transesectomy uh, rather than thoracotomies and so on in, in HIV patients. But if they've got acute onset neurology, severe kyphosis, I'll do the same thing. Can you show that picture you did a cost of transesectomy? Is that just to drain the pus? Just to drain the pus. Yeah. And, and then HIV, you just put them on 18 months, you said? No, used to. That was, that was, I, I'm talking about 18 years ago when I started as a consultant. That's where I used to do it then. Since I, I've been there, we treated them the same. But we, we must remember in those days, South African politics, we never treat, we were treating with retrovirals. There was no retroviral therapy available for HIV. But now we've got a very good retroviral program. But I mean, it, it is, it does, look, HIV does depend on, you know, what the CD4 count is, how well nourished they are. I mean, I do albumin with all my patients. I won't do a reconstructive procedure on somebody with albumin of less than 21. I mean, it's also just a waste of time, you know. So you feed them up. Uh, but, if, you know, if they, sometimes you get that stage 4 HIV. We, we don't do, you know, the, the World Health Organization says HIV with TB is stage 4. We don't believe that. There's so much TB and so much HIV in my country, the probability of getting both is quite high. But if they come and they're obviously full of pus and in a bad state, then I regard as AIDS and they'll be very conservative. And the halo you used in that young girl was because you used those plated... Yeah, that's just because I was un that's unhappy with the about. stability. That's why the next one that came, I put this, the lateral mass screws from behind. I don't know which one was better. She fell off, you know. I mean, this is the thing with children. You try one thing and then it doesn't work, and then the next one you adapt. You know, it's very difficult to... What's your uh, antibody regime for pyogen and non tuberculosis? Yeah, so like you, our staph aureus is the commonest. So normally what we do is we I biopsy all of them. But we, send, we gently start them empirically on cloxacillin. We use a lot of cloxacillin. And uh, with a gram-negative cover as well, like augmented. And then we would respond to the culture. It's usually clox. I mean, that's usually the situation. So IV and then all? Uh, yeah. So IV, but short. IV is normally a few days until the drip tissues and we change. Because usually a good response. Somebody asked about the CRP as morning. My experience, if you've got effective treatment, your CRP halves every week. You know, 200, 150, 25. You know you're winning. You know? Um, and then I, I empirically treat for six weeks off. We go oral proxicillin. But, you know, we have 95% TB, 5% biotin. You know. Any other questions? Selected cases where somebody's had a previous infection and I'm now doing a revision of these. I've got concerns because I mean I sat through there was one session at SRS I think last year where there must have been six or seven papers of vancomycin, right? Everybody's doing vancomycin. And you looked at the papers, and like even today, Professor Baston presented a paper of 2.6% to 0.2%. But there's always longitudinal studies and there's always massive interventions. So there's learning curve on the surgeon, reduced operative time, increased uh, cognizance of infection, so wash out, all those things. So it's not just a bank of mice and change, you know? It's like, there's so many changes that, so I, I, I think that, that data is, is not reliable. Secondly, my infection rate is very low. I mean, I know the Americans seem to have like 
you know, two, three, four percent infection rates. I, we just published now in Global Spine Journal our treatment of deep site infection. And we had nine, in my personal series, 19 cases of deep infection I've managed in three and a half thousand cases. So it's a small number. So now to put vancomycin in 3,500 people for 90, you know, when we know it creates um, sterile drainage and the other problems. So my answer is no, I don't use it. I don't think. But if, if I have a, had a patient of I think is at very high risk, I would, I would consider doing it, but not as a routine. They also have a different protocol, you know. The surgery gets extended your three hours. The surgeon, as well as the other people, and there will be knee scrub and if I remember correctly, I think it was in Spine Journal some years ago, they swabbed the patient every half an hour and from 30 minutes into the surgery you can culture commensals off the wound. Yes. And then and there's other papers that looked at the bone grass harvesting. Now you just look at it, you take a bone grass, you stick it there, everybody's full, it drives you mad, the nursing sister take, keeps touching it when she takes it off your, your you know, your forceps. They've cultured bacteria off the back, you know. So I think it's a miracle not everybody gets infected when we operate. When you see what, like a neuromuscular scoliosis, where you split something from T2 to the pelvis, you damage all the muscle, you have blood everywhere, it bleeds off. It's a miracle they don't become septic, actually. Um, and so I'm, you know, for me, I think that to avoid infection, you've got to be quick, you know, try and minimize your muscle damage and patient selection. I mean, those are, I think, far more important than vancomycin, yes or no. When vancomycin, there's a study from Ganga, where they looked at nearly 1,000 patients, a randomized control trial, and they found no difference between the two groups, but they still used it. Yeah. They, still use it. Yeah. They, they, they didn't find any difference because they felt that their paper was the only one that did not show the difference, whereas all other studies showed that there was a reduction, like they said. Yeah. Have they completely changed the rate of fusion? No. But that's, that's the thing, I, th I think a lot of the studies are not, it's not good evidence. I mean, a lot of, this, you know, most studies are not good evidence. Basically. Okay. Yeah,